day, mate. This is the ESOP guy. Of course, I'm not Australian, so I'll, I'll kind of bag that right now. Thank you guys for joining. And if this is your very first episode of the ESOP guy, Journey to an ESOP and Beyond, thank you. If you've been traveling around with us a little bit, thank you as well. And today we're going to get into something I think is important. And I'll start off before I start off with what we're going to talk about. I just want to tell you kind of what I've been thinking about and preparing for as we get closer to the fall is just the normal series of conferences that kind of come up, um, getting ready for the NCEO conference. And as I have thought through that, I've been thinking about how important it is uh, to be prepared um, and help people and the podcast to be prepared for who you're going to meet in the conferences. So let me start with this and then I'll get into the topic. Have you seen enough, Mrs. Nudson? But that money was supposed to go toward an operation for his grandmother. There we go. <laughs> He's a confidence man, a trickster. Will Madame Sanz a complaint? Gladly. A confidence man, a trickster. This topic today is called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And please don't like, I mean, I'm just going to start off with the topic here. Please don't get too focused on that. Like Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, I'm not trying to say in any negative way that you're walking into a conference and everybody's a dirty rotten scoundrel. So let me just get that right off the, right on the plate, right off the plate and say, look, that's not what we're going to get into. However, there is a sense of what, what people are already thinking when they go to a conference, like who can I trust? Who's, you know, who's legit in this and, and, and who's not legit in this? And is there, is there a reason for me to even be talking about this, you know, from a, from the standpoint of, a episode of the podcast. So, so dirty rotten scan, scoundrels in terms of my advisor and how we should go about thinking about your ESOP advisor. Very important topic. And as I as I go into this, the reason I think it's so important is because there are so many people that you will meet at a conference, and it's I would say relatively confusing. And I think one of the major confusing parts about it, and, and or it can be, is that you're walking into a world of let's just say experts at a topic that you're probably not an expert on, you know, and, or at, and you wouldn't be probably listening to this podcast if you were. And so the idea behind it is, is that if somebody is an expert at something and you are not, you might be an expert at, you know, mechanical engineering or at um, some technology software code that nobody understands, you know, and you know it, you understand it. But but people that do ESOP work are generally pretty good at it, and they're ne- they normally do they they normally are in a sense experts. Now, the the choice around the expertise is how they communicate that and how they actually teach people about what they need to know in terms of actually trying to help them, and that's the that's fundamental to the mission that we're on with this podcast because it's really not about you hiring or finding me and saying, hey, I want to I want to hire you to do my work. It's really about you understanding, is an ESOP really right for you? Does it even make sense for you, for, for you and your company? Um, it's more about ruling out that possibility. Secondly, then if it is right for you, if you've gone through all the education and you've done the research, then the second part is, is who you're going to work with. And that's really kind of what we're going to talk about today. And this is primarily going to be more of a pre-ESOP topic. I know we've jumped into some post-ESOP, but this is going to be primarily more of the pre-ESOP part. So if you continue to listen, that's what we're going to talk about today. Go to our website at journeytoanesop.com. You'll find out a ton of information on, on other episodes that may be helpful. If you like the podcast, please share it with a friend. Please give us a five-star rating. It's super helpful for people that are looking for this type of resource and want to know that it is, is something that could be helpful to them. And so with that, um, I will just say that as we start off, the first thing I wanted to say is this Dirty Rotten Scoundrels movie um, is a movie that is, a, is a, obviously it's a comedy, came out in 1988. What happened in 1988 Personally, I graduated from high school. So this is an old movie, right? And it stars some people that are like probably beyond, you know, some people that are younger, right? That really had um, a sense for who they are, but Steve Martin and Michael Caine, and they're super funny people. Um, This was one of those kind of 
kind of, I would just say a hilarious comedic, you know, comedic type of movie. However, the undertones and the theme of the movie were that, Hey, people are going to take advantage of other people. So the whole storyline is about two con men, confidence men that end up in the Riviera. One is like a highly professional con man has a whole thing orchestrated with the, the, the city uh, chief of police and that's Michael Caine. And then Steve Martin shows up to town. They basically get into, um, uh, you know, an alignment and then they kind of separate and then they compete. And then they try to like dupe this, this woman who is a better con person than they are. Right. And so it's, it's kind of funny at the same time, there's also this undertone of like, Hey, this is totally terrible. Like they're totally taking advantage of people by lying to them and you ought not to do that. Right. So um, so anyway, that's that's the movie. The reason I'm using it today is because I do think that there's um, the the purpose and the the practice and the methodology of a con person is 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 to deceive somebody into making a decision without really understanding what they're doing, and it's a process of of using whatever methodology of deception. It could be um, sympathy. It could be um, bring somebody into something where they feel like they're, they're empowered to do something. And now they feel justified and they don't, the first thing is they just don't know the whole, the, the truth. And that's why it's important to understand like the whole landscape of these things. And as I, as I lay out and unpack this, I want to start with this. And again, I wanted to kind of make sure I, I mentioned, um, as I say, the topic itself could be really construed in a very negative way. Like, Everybody you go to the conference is not a dirty, rotten scoundrel, right? These are really good people. And the ESOP community in general is really um, um, a combination of really great people that want to help each other and help help others, right? So please don't misconstrue that. Part of that's for the dramatic effect of it all. So, and it, and it partly is wanting to get across the idea that it could feel like for some people too, and unfair to the ESOP advisors, it could feel like, who can I trust? And some people might walk away with this, go to a conference and like, I don't know anybody, I don't trust anybody, and never make a decision to go towards ESOP because you just can't find the um, the advisor for you, right? So hopefully what I'm going to do as we talk about this is to strip away any paranoia when it comes to that and give you a roadmap of things I think would be helpful to you as your looking at not only does an ESOP work for you and your company and your situation, or in addition to that, how would you move forward in the situation with an advisor? Where do you start? Um, and really just try to be a resource along those things. Now, high level, as I start talking about this on a high level basis, what, what happens typically, if I just kind of peeled it back a little bit, I would say that Decisions that people make aren't generally are not normally hasty when it comes to an ESOP. So that's so that's not something I think people normally have to worry about. You know, there are cases where people go to a conference, they get super jazzed up, they hire the first person they see, and you know, off off they're running. Or they talk to their friend, and the friend says, "Hey, you should use this advisor because I used them," and blah blah blah. And they don't really ever vet out the friend's advisor; they just kind of jump in, and they realize maybe later or whenever that that was probably not a good fit for them. We had over the last year, we've had some people um, come to us as, as new clients or potential new clients. Right. And, and, and a number of them have done different things. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those things. I think there were very, very structured approaches to hiring the person, the, the advisors that they thought that they needed to help them with that. So I think on a high level, there's a sense of, um, you know, trying to figure out like, what is a good advisor for you? Obviously, you know, when you think about the the place that you're at in life, you're, you're most likely a very established and successful business person or uh, persons where, where you've done this before you've hired professionals to do different things. So you're not going to just be tapping into nothing, right? You're tapping into experience at hiring, maybe the way you hired your CPA, or maybe the way you hired your attorney, or maybe the way you hired whomever in your professional services. So there's obviously a base a ground floor there of just, I understand how to interview people. I'm not going to get into that at all. What I want to get into um, is really just the, the first part of this is 
understanding when you go first off to a conference, who are you going to be running into and how do they affect your life? And it depending, and it really kind of depends on what stage of the ESOP you're in. And that would, um, and then also just kind of who, who may be a better fit for you in terms of, of some types of uh, different types of advisors that do some of the same things that overlap. So we're going to get into that. So, you know, when you think about, first off, let me think about, let me just kind of express one of the things about ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, is that we, we all should know from a, from a very basic level that an ESOP is a retirement plan. And as such, as a retirement plan, it is governed by the Department of Labor and also the Internal Revenue Service. So when we talk about the Department of Labor, we're going to immediately talk about ERISA and ERISA law. So that means we're going to have attorneys involved. And when we talk about the uh, IRS side, you're going to have tax attorneys, you're going to have tax people involved. In addition to that, you're going to have, because it's a retirement plan, you're going to have third-party administrators that help to guide a plan. So that's going to be part of it. Because an ESOP itself is a trust, you're going to have trustees. And so some of the people that we're talking about are by nature and relative to their discipline, they're going to be there for the purposes of of what they actually provide us as a service directly related to those to those roles and and respective roles that they have of their career of their discipline so obviously an attorney trustee third party administrator CPA those kind of people and so keep in mind you know you're you're going to you're going to look at that and run into those types of people so Specifically, when we start breaking this down, let me just kind of say categorically, you're going to have a lot of different, um, you're going to have attorneys there. And some of the attorneys are going to be attorneys that represent the trustee. Some of the attorneys are going to be attorneys that represent the company. When we say the company, we mean eventually the proposed ESOP. And it may be an existing ESOP and that, that attorney is representing the company side. So what happens is the attorneys can do, and some of them do both, right? And they kind of flip flop back and forth. Some of the attorneys in the, the conferences um, professionally will do other things like sell side advisory work with the attorney work. And so there's a there's a combination of things that they're doing that, again, is, is helpful just to understand and give you kind of the basics behind it. So a lot of attorneys, and I could try to come up with an attorney joke, but I'm not going to at this point, but there's a lot of attorneys there. So um, the second category would be bankers. Bankers are there. So these are normally going to be um, larger bank institutions like say Chase Bank and Bank of America and Wells Fargo, those kind of larger national um, banking banking institutions or, or even global. Um, and then you're going to have like smaller more regional banks that are that are more niche niched into ESOPs, um, and then you're going to have other types of banks that are maybe not not they're like non banks getting into it, and in that you're going to have another subset of bankers that are specializing in SBA. But what's their role there? Their role is to help provide uh, financing to fund the transaction, and so. Um, as we talk about their role there, I mean, of course, it's really helpful to talk to them and, and ask the question like, Hey, what do you, what do you typically do? How much do you usually lend? Those kind of things are, are great to, to talk to them about. Um, the next group of people would be the trustees. Now the trustees are going to be because they're an ESOP is an employee stock ownership trust. They are going to serve the role as either the, tra- uh, well, both really the transaction trustee, which is the role of of being the buyer in a negotiated transaction. And then eventually they would become the ongoing trustee. So they are going to be the ones that are responsible for the plan and the ESOP trust to make sure that those are done and operating according to the way that they're set up to, to make sure that they're um, following all the, the fiduciary responsibilities they are supposed to as a retirement plan. The next group would be, um, well, let me go back to the trustees. So the trustees are going to be, you're going to find them in two categories. Generally speaking, you're going to have individual trustees who are really their own, you know, entities by themselves with a group of people. So they could have an individual trustee 
with a firm who has ultimately like people that work for them, but the trustee's the decision maker and the other people are more support staff related to the trustee doing and being engaged as the trustee for the ESOP plan. And then you're going to have institutional trustees that are more bank-like and they're going to have more of a, uh, a corporate veil around them where they're operating as an employee of the institutional um, trust company. And so those are the two types and you're going to kind of meet those people as well. The next group would be people like third-party administrators and their role is going to be to do the accounting for the ESOP plan so that the participant statements and all the accounting going into the allocations has been done on an annual basis correctly and being then accounted for in a 5,500 report for a retirement plan. That is the, the TPA's responsibility to make sure that those done, that, that has been done correctly within the, uh, the guidelines of IRS and the guidelines of ERISA, the guidelines of the actual plan document, and that is a um, an annual, typically an annual um, function that they serve. In addition to helping with other things, you know, in in what they would do if, if they have you know maybe multiple service offerings, but the primary is going to be the accounting. The there are things that they will do to help, like with repurchase liability studies, those kind of things. Uh, the other ones that would would be kind of the, the I guess the mention, and as as I get closer to to this one, is it's more important to kind of group all of this in terms of um, the the ESOP advisors that really operate as sell side advisors, and this would be a slash feasibility advisor. So they kind of fin- they kind of fit both of those roles. Feasibility, as we talk about ESOPs, is going to be the work that's done to determine whether or not the, how the ESOP is actually going to work. And that's going to be done in a lot of different ways, depending on who these people are and how they operate. And then the sell side part is usually a continuation of that, of that role. So the sell side advisory part is going to be part of the role of, of actually conducting the transaction. So within that, there's going to be other subsets of, of things that they will do, which could include sourcing, financing, um, it usually would include organizing the whole uh, transaction itself and being the 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 party that goes back and builds po- most likely the team that you're going to have on the sell side and the team that's going to happen on the buy side. So those are the those are the main folks that we're going to get into. Of course, there are other people like CPAs and um, different types of professionals. Insurance folks are going to be an important element there that. Um, we don't get into a lot of, but they are absolutely important because particularly with respect to fiduciary insurance and and the process of, of making sure you understand like how fiduciary insurance works is really important. Um, they also will be helpful at help helping to, to source the DNO insurance for the board. So definitely insurance people are going to be an important part of the advisory groups that you're going to get to meet at these conferences. Your Highness, don't be alarmed. I can be trusted. Are you one of my subjects? No, I'm an American, Fanny Eubanks of Omaha. You can be trusted, but he can't be trusted. I couldn't help overhearing if you're in trouble and there's some way I can help. Thank you, but I cannot accept. You've already risked too much just in speaking to me. I still want to help. You must understand, I have powerful enemies. They may be watching even as we... My God, you're attractive. (laughs) Totally, totally conning this lady. It's late. I must go. This is Michael Caine jumping off a balcony, dramatically getting this woman to believe that he's a, a... a royal person who needs help in his efforts to save ultimately the freedom fighters. And then she's so like excited about it because now she feels like she's part of this whole thing. So classic con. Has he left? Yes, just a moment ago. Good. Please. 
You must tell me where he lives. I feel it only fair to warn you. I know. He, he told me he has powerful enemies. There may also be an emotional risk. You see, his highness has been a widower for five years. Please, Here it goes. Highness. Fanny. The Freedom Fighters. Thank you. The Freedom Fighters. Thank you. So hook, line, sinker. She spends um, money on this guy and blah, blah, blah. And so the whole point is is getting conned, right? And now, again, I'm, I'm using this as our as example. Um, and I don't want to be too overly dramatic either as far as this goes because it could be taken the wrong way. However, prudence... And the caveat, I guess the caveat emptor, right? You know, let the buyer beware. As you go to a conference and you're looking at who can help me, the first part of our topic was really to kind of lay out the the landscape of the people, the ESOP professionals that you're going to get to talk to. Um, now we're going to cover just things I think are, are important to just say best practices. And again, not to be redundant on some things that you might already know, um, but just thinking about ways to help consider a good a good way to kind of help or make a, a checklist of items that that might help you uh, determine like who do you want to work with and how and how do you want to go about hiring them so i think it's kind of goes without saying but the first the first part of the best practices here is is let's not get too hasty right let's not get too um quick to make a decision on on who you're going to work with and obvious there's obvious reasons behind that um one of the one of the experiences i had a long time ago and doing esop work was um, i had a client who came to us through an attorney who had started working with the client and they and this client had gone to a, a conference and they had um, hired the first trustee they found and they didn't do any analysis they didn't do any work on actually planning out their their ESOP transaction. And so they had gone through this whole beginning process, kind of putting the cart before the horse and not really understanding what they're getting into. And and, and the bottom line is that, that, you know, they didn't do anything wrong, but they got super excited about the concept of ESOP. So they go to the conference, get super excited. What happens next? They meet people and like, all right, let's get, the, let's just get this thing rolling. Right. And because uh, they did that, they kind of wasted some money. Of course, they wasted some time too, and the process was uh, much much different when they come back. When they came back over, and we kind of worked through, let's start over again. Let's start at the beginning. And so, don't be hasty. Take your time. Do your due diligence. Have some idea. When you know, a lot of times people go to the conferences, they're they're not thinking they're going to do an ESOP for like a couple of years. But what I do find is that there are, is a, an excitement around this idea. Let's do this. This is great. Everybody's excited. You start telling people in your company about doing an ESOP and you start putting pressure on yourself. So one of the other parts of this is, is hold off on really communicating that this is something that you want to do until you've done your research and your homework. And there are really excellent areas of evaluating, is this ESOP right for you? There are um, specific conferences with like the NCEO that are specifically for the, this, is this even work? So you can do some preliminary um, work. Of course, this podcast is dedicated to that front. And then reading, reading as much as you can, there are articles, there's tons and tons of information. And I think when you start thinking about the list of is an ESOP right for you. Start th thinking about the very beginning. What are your goals and objectives in as the shareholder, which are really the decision makers behind moving forward on ESOP? And, it, and of course, it could be people that are key people that are in the company that are not shareholders that are listening. And same thing for them would be make a very written, quantified, or detailed list of goals and objectives that you want to accomplish and with the ESOP, and that could include, hey, I want this this kind of return on my my stock as I as I go into the transaction, or this is how I want my my payout. It could be very financially driven. It could also be very, um, in addition to that, it could be other things that you want to accomplish. Like we want to we want to continue to improve our culture using the ESOP. We want to continue to work through our succession plan. The ESOP will help us do that. Could be we want to 
um, work through a, a growth strategy. And this is how we think the ESOP could really help us do that. There's, there's a lot of things that you can do to anticipate how to use the ESOP. And I think having a, a set of written goals and objectives can help as you do these other very, you know, specific tasks in order to determine who you're going to work with. And that's kind of the, the gist here is to avoid, of course, the dirty, rotten scoundrel. Um, and, and again, I'm being very, very facetious about that. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm certainly not labeling ESOP people as dirty, rotten scoundrels. But the point is, is that you want to feel like you've you've hired the right people for your efforts that you're going to go forward on. So once you have all that, I think the next step is to really then lay out a game plan. And you, at this point, you probably have a list of, of potential people that you're going to hire. And, it, and I, and I would just say kind of, as we start thinking about this, there are a couple of ways to go at the beginning. The couple of ways to go are, Hey, I'm going to hire a traditional sell side advisor investment banking firm. Right. And all the things I've talked about related to investment banking firms is hopefully that you're aware, like the cost structure there is, is pretty high in relationship to a regulated M&A ESOP transaction. So you you navigate that. If it's complicated and you really do want that, then obviously work through the analysis on who those who those firms might be. There are sell-side firms, advisory firms that, of course, are not. Um, they're advisory firms that charge advisory fees. They're not charging you a success fee. So that might be the category you're looking for. And within that grouping, like for us, we are a CPA firm that provides that. There are other CPA firms, I think, that provide that kind of service. Um, there are attorneys that do both. So some attorney firms try to do both of those things and kind of be the one-stop shop type of thing. And it's and it comes down to, I think, some of the preferences behind that and, and experiences. One, as we talk about vetting out those those individuals, I will say that the key person or persons you hire at the front end are going to also lead you to the other hires that you're going to have on the buy side, including the trustee, the independent valuation firm, and, and the other attorney on the deal, as well as other, you know, re- other parties. So that includes the third party administrator, those kind of people. So, so this is going to be the first, the real key hire that you're going to make is the, the, the company that, and the advisors that are going to help structure everything. So within that realm, one of the first best practices we should be thinking about is incorporating how much like quantifying, like what do they do? How do they do it? Right. How much experience do they have, you know, in doing ESOP transactions? So it could be, you know, maybe list out the client, the the transactions that they have done, or um, there, there could get into some specifics as to the nature and size of those transactions. So within the experience level, um, do you I mean, even sometimes geographically, if that's important to you, what does that look like? Um, just so you have some idea of, of how much that experience translates to your specific ESOP deal and to make sure that that is a good for you, a good sense of like, yeah, that, that means that they would be a good fit for us in that sense. Um, one question you might want to ask is like, what, what other services, what types of services do you offer? I get, get very specific as to the services, but also that kind of leads us into the processes that they go through. Like give us a very specific roadmap and a process and maybe even examples of some deliverables as far as how you go about it. So, so you, one of the things that is kind of standardized in our ESOP industry is that they will do some kind of feasibility analysis on the transaction. So what does the feasibility analysis kind of look like? What are we getting? Is it a big PowerPoint slideshow? Um, is it just a lot of information that um, is coming? And, and how useful is that information to you in terms of making decisions? Because when you think about feasibility and you're evaluating that aspect of what this, what services are being offered to you, um, I think it's important to do to think about feasibility in the sense of not just is it feasible, but is it how and why is it feasible? And so can I, from the information provided as the user of that information, can I, as the as the user or purchaser of the services, can I can I manipulate that data to ask some very specific questions in terms of structure that could be 
percentage of how much I'm going to sell. That could be the, the amount of stock, um, not just the amount of stock, but the amount of debt that that's going to be required, both senior debt and seller note, the structure of the tax benefits around the nature of an S corp versus C corp. A lot of those initial like presentation parts of the, of the, uh, feasibility, can they be manipulated into asking different questions so that really where I'm getting at that is can they help shape it into something that optimizes your goals and objectives? And that's what coming back to that very beginning list. So I think that's kind of obviously important in the process. Um, I think you owe it to yourself to be very, very direct and ask fee structure questions like how much does it cost? What is this? What am I paying for? And then within the fee structure questions, how much time does it take to do each of these functions? And then, of course, within that, who am I going to be working with? Like, what what does the team look like and what are their backgrounds and experience and everything else? So as you as you start to evaluate those those aspects, you may get like a very formalized proposal, which is fine. Um, but really, at the meat of the proposal it, are all these things that we're trying to kind of ask questions. And part of this process, like as I say, it does take time, right? And you want to you want to be efficient about how you're using your time. So you might, as you if you interview like three firms, and you're like, hey, I want to just see. You might have a, a a template that you create, some kind of way to approach the. Um, you know, comparisons between who's doing what. One thing that's, that's interesting about this area of, of advisory is it is relatively different for each advisor, the way that they go about things. And that's why having possibly sampled deliverables is helpful to kind of see what you're getting and how it's working. Now, one of the things that just kind of makes sense to me is that you're going to want to at least if you if you have this level and and this happens every once in a while but it's i think it's a really good idea you know why don't why don't you talk to people that they've done deals with and ask questions about the processes that they've gone through um at some point in your evaluation process so that you can get a, a good sense of of what the client experiences were were now i'd be surprised they're going to give you any clients that had a bad experience right so keep that as a, as a grain of salt right like that's just Take it is what it is, but if they don't have any, right, that that's also an indicator. So having a good client reference is helpful to understand that this was this is a good this was a good experience for for that client. So it could be a good experience for you. So as you um, as you go through that process too, one of the things that I think is important in doing ESOPs is is the why behind it, you know? And I think that's something that we have talked about on the podcast a little bit, but, you know, you're you're pursuing this from a why perspective, which is I want to do an ESOP because, because it, it works for me as a shareholder and it works for my company and it works for my key people. I want to do an ESOP because it helps to transition the legacy of the business into um, a group of people that will will continue to um, pursue the same level of objectives that we had originally in our in our mission and what we tried to set out. So, so the the why behind your ESOP is important, and 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 I kind of bring that up here because I think part of it is probably not as obvious, but I think that the advisors that work in the ESOP space have their own whys. And I would say why, one question I might ask is like, what? why do you do ESOP work? And it's kind of probably maybe even a strange thing to say. I mean, of course, I do ESOP work because I like to do it and it, and it makes sense and I make money at it or whatever. But the point is, is that I think that as I've done ESOP work for now several, several years, right, and over this um, time of doing the podcast, I've actually really thought about my own why of doing ESOP work. And the more I've thought about it, the real, they realize that as we have aligned our clients, you know, in terms of our selection process, like this is a client that we want to work with. What I realize is that very best, op, very best experiences that we've had have been when our why aligns with their why. And our philosophy of an ESOP in terms of putting one together is much, very much about holistic holistic planning and win-wins that makes sense not 
trying to maximize um, a shareholder's multiple on the deal coming out of the deal. That's not our why. Our, that's not what we're doing. Like that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we believe in the concept. And if if my strategy and philosophy and notion behind why I'm doing ESOP work as an advisor aligns well with that strategy and philosophy of the client, then I think that's a very good um, relationship. You know, and within that, what I think ultimately is happening is there has to be, and this is part of the best practices, but it's one of those things that I wanted to kind of build up as we talk about it. There has to be a deep sense of trust between the advisor and the client. And some of the, some of the elements of trust will simply just happen naturally as you start working together. Like, okay, now we've done some work. You kind of see how we're thinking about things. The questions we ask a, a client or as we go through specific, you know, preparations for parts of the ESOP process are, are going to naturally build trust with a client. But, but ultimately at the, at the, I guess at the core, the trust is, be, is there because there's an alignment of philosophy. And so that's, that's a little bit more difficult to get at, but, but if I were sitting down and I'm on the side of the, the, the table, making a decision, I or an ESOP advisor, I really do want to understand, like, why did you get into this business in the first place? What was motivating you? And you can hear this in some of our episodes when we interview people, like I do ask the question frequently, why did you, why'd you even get into ESOPs? Like, what do you, what do you like about it? And a lot of times you're going to hear people say, because it's, it's something that they really believe in. And they believe in the concept of employee ownership and they want to help build that into companies all over the country. So that's a pretty good why when you get down to it. And you can kind of tell like if it's an answer that's, you know, pretentious and you're like, oh yeah, right, right. My, you know, and we're walking, watching all these things in, in the election right now. Right. And, and, and honestly, I hate politics, but I, it's necessary. Right. And so when you look, when you watch the debates and stuff, you're like, okay, you know, you can kind of see through all of these different things that people say. And, and it, it, honestly, it's just terrible, but at the same time, you, you know, thank God we're not dealing with politicians within the ESOP world. Right. It's, it's professionals that really do ultimately, I think, um, overall really do want to help. So I think understanding their why behind it and, and aligning that with your, your why is a very effective way to, to hire the right. Um, and I think some of that has to do with personality anyway. So the next part of that is like, of course, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, you want that personality to click with your personality and the group of people that you're working with on your side. So it could be your key people, multiple shareholders. So you're going to want to like get a sense for that. Like, is there, is there a deeper sense of we are, we are, there's good chemistry here to work through this. Now, this is really kind of focused in on the transaction side, but this is also something that I think leads into the other part of, of the best practices because as we start to segue into some of these other elements, what we are thinking about is other people that you're going to hire. And one of those, those people is going to be the transaction trustee and the value, the independent valuation firm, which is really hired by the trustee. Now, the point of this is that we have, we got to not get focused so much on the transaction that we lose sight of all of these different relationships that we're going to be building the truth on the sell side advisor relationship is that it is much more of a short term focus. And so a lot of those, the, the relationships that we build through that need to be there, need to be solid, but ultimately that's going to lead to um, long term relationships with trustees and valuation firms, third party administrators. And we want those to be good. Now, overall, one of the things that I think are important to interview on and ask questions about is, is how, and this comes back to a little bit about philosophy, but as how does the advisor structure the deal so that the company and its long-term people have very solid relationships that are going to make sense? And that includes the bank. And that includes other people that are they're, they're going to be working with in the long term. So obviously that's going to be important for um, you to think about and understand how they're not just delivering a good transaction, but how are they delivering overall a very healthy company with good relationships, you know, that can 
sustain everything that's going to come after the ESOP. And who knows what's going to come after the ESOP? Because honestly, anything can happen. You know, I love forecasting and everything else. But when we think about forecasting and the financials, we don't know what's going to happen. And any company can go through a downturn and it can happen like that for one of one reason or another, right? And then other sides that can go up and you can have uh, abundance and then scarcity. So building it for the future is important. So along that line, one of the questions that we want, we want to ask is just this idea that how do you, you know, we talked about the why, now it's more of the how. How do you build this to ensure as best you possibly can sustainability? Sustainability would be um, being able to work and weather through downturns. Sustainability would be you know, estimating potential issues related to repurchase liability and, and things that are going to come down the road so that there's not this just dramatic myopic focus on just getting the deal done, but there's a wider view of, of does this work? And that could be financially, and that could also be other things that include the, the long-term transition plan or the short-term transition plan of an owner to an employee to somebody that's just on the board of directors. So how do they function around that? How do they give you advice to get you through some of these things that are just um, better understanding and, and, and really advising on, on some levels of, of things that are just beyond a spreadsheet, beyond a PowerPoint, beyond some of these other things? And experientially, how does that, how does that work with your clients? And so that's why it's kind of cool to talk to some existing clients that people have worked with. And in some cases, you can talk to the owners that are that are either on the board and have exited and, and just see what their experience is and, and just understand that better. But I do think this is a very important, obviously, we spent this much time on, on this podcast. This is a very important um, part of the decisions you're making going towards an ESOP. I do think it's very confusing, unfortunately, when you go to a conference and you're and you've got 15 million business cards of different people doing it. And so I think it's important to take your time, as I've said before, um, act intelligently, not quickly would be the, the, um, the phrase of just slow it down, look at what's in front of you, ask the questions, um, and be careful with everybody's recommendations and referrals. Do your homework for yourself. If your friend used somebody and they loved them, great, interview them, do the research, do all the things that we just talked about. Um, because you won't be sorry if you take the time and hire the right people. You will be sorry if you go through this whole process and realize it was structured in a way that is not in alignment with what you really wanted at the front end. So hopefully that helps you today. It was It's kind of one of those um, fun ones for me just to kind of play around with this, this movie. Um, it was 1988. I graduated from high school back then. So um, this was my second Steve Martin one, by the way, which I did Pink Panther um, a few weeks ago. So we'll see. He's funny. That's probably one of the reasons why I chose it. But for for everybody that's listening, thank you guys for listening today. And go to our website at journeytoanesop.com. Um, if you have more questions, reach out f- on our uh, form there you can fill out in the website and look forward to our next step on this journey to an ESOP.